Hello, I'm the Dark Master. Welcome back to the history of Mississippi. In this episode, I will be discussing the second epoch of the Carboniferous, Pennsylvanian. This epoch has most of the coal we use to power electricity, as opposed to the Mississippians marine limestone deposits. Please note that outside of North America, these two periods are fuzzier, and as such are treated as part of a larger Carboniferous period. Pangea was almost fully formed, but there was still a shallow sea separating North and South China from the rest of Pangaea in the Pennsylvanian epoch. The Carboniferous saw the rise of all modern classes of fungi. Along with them, formatiforms, a major prominent of the marine fauna in today's world, finally rose to prominence in the Pennsylvanian. As stated in the last episode, trilobites and eurypterids saw a steady decline in numbers, with only one family of trilobites, the protids, making it to the Permian. The true eurypterids had been reduced to one minuscule genre. The other eurypterids still thrived, however, as sweet feeders, such as Mega Arachne which at first was confused for a giant spider, hence the name. Sharks are often considered living fossils, perfect hunting machines that haven't changed ever. While some of this is true, with Siormia looking superficially very much like modern sharks, however, the Carboniferous also saw some very strange forms. These included some of the strangest sharks of all, the petalodontiforms, which barely resembled sharks at all and ate shellfish. There was also the bottom feeder Meraspis that coexisted with these strange beasts. Bony fish also exploded in diversity. This era saw the peak of the Rhysodonts and they achieved their maximum size. This also saw the emergence of paleoichthyiforms, such as platyxomas. It is thought that they migrated to and from freshwater, much like modern-day salmon. On land, the huge increase in plants allowed the, inc the increase of oxygen this allowed several groups of insects, such as the dragonfly-like griffin flies, such as Mega Neurera, to evolve into some of the biggest insects ever. This time also saw the largest known land invertebrate of all time, the giant millipede Arthropleura. These joined the already established Pulmoscorpius and terrestrial sea scorpions like Mega Arachne in what was the last dynasty of the giant insects. Tetrapods underwent a massive increase in diversity during the Pennsylvanian. Let's start first with the non-amniotes, aka the non-reptiles. Non-amniotes, not or, rept or as what we would call amphibians, are divided into two groups. The Bactromorphs, which are more related to modern amphibians and are therefore true amphibians, and the reptilomorphs, which are more closely related to reptiles. They're still amphibians, but evolutionary speaking, they're more advanced than the other amphibian group. Starting with the bactromorphs, in addition to the three living groups of amphibians, the frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians, there were four extinct orders that thrived during the Pennsylvanian. 
these were the Temnospondactyli, the Astopoda, the Nectrida, and the Microsauria. The Temnospondyli were the largest order and contained many families. The primitive Etopoidea lived more on land than their relatives. The small Balanorpeton and relations in the Dendrepetondidae served as small, small predators in swampy areas. Some of the Temnospondyli continued to adapt to land, co-evolving into similar forms such as the reptilomorphs. Examples of these include the Caesops and the Dysorphidae, and the Europidae also lived on land. However, the vast majority remained aquatic and grew into massive freshwater predators, including the largest amphibian ever, Prionosuchus. They inhabited a niche that modern-day alligators now fill. The second order, Aestopata, was much smaller and less diverse than their larger relatives. These serpent-like amphibians have ignamic origins, with the older species, Lethoscuus, already very specialized and leaving very little known of their origins. It is believed that they filled the same niche as modern snakes. The third order, the Netridas, were a diverse order of extinct amphibians. They were a small group of small newt-like amphibians. There were three families. They were the aquatic Eurocoidelae, which were newt-like predators, the terrestrial Schinosauridae, and the bizarrely horned Diplocolidae. Unlike the similar microsaurs, they didn't have highly reduced legs. Speaking of the microsaurs, the fourth of the extinct true amphibian orders. Arguably the most diverse in form of all orders, some have highly reduced limbs like their relatives, Astopata, and swum like modern eels. Others were like modern salamanders, mostly terrestrial and climbing under leaf litter. Others were like short-tailed toads, mainly terrestrial that inhabited drier areas. With all this diversity, it's no wonder that the Pennsylvanian, or the Carboniferous as a whole, is called the Age of Amphibians, much like how the Devonian was called the Age of Fishes. However, this is only half of the amphibian family. The other half was just as diverse. The reptilomorphs in general were more adapted to life on land than their Bactromorphs relatives. If you saw them, you'd probably think they were weird, large lizards. However, unlike lizards and other true amniotes, they had to lay their eggs in the water. There were six orders of reptilomorphs, but unlike their true amphibian relatives, they are all extinct. They are Embolomeri, Chronosuca, Geogrostegidae, Simoria morphae, Solodonsaurus and Didecomorphae. Chronosuchia and Simoria didn't come around until the Permian, and as such, I won't discuss them this episode. However, remember they are highly important. Imbolomeri were an order of reptilomorphs that returned to the water. They're the reason I said in general at the introduction of reptilomorphs. They were similar to crocodiles, but were smaller than other aquatic predators of the time. Best way I can describe it is, imagine if a reptile tried to be a salamander. Solodonosaurus is the only member of its family. It was highly adapted to land and was a small predator. The third order, the Lepihidostegidae, have some of the smallest reptilomorphs found. They were so closely resembling reptiles that they could easily be mistaken, except for a few features. 
They had larger skulls than average reptiles and loose vertebrae, which meant they were not as well adapted to land as true reptiles. The final order, Didecomorphes, were arguably the most successful reptile-like amphibians. The three families were hugely successful and inhabited various niches. Didecidae, or true Didecomorphs, were large herbivores that included Didecomorphs itself. The Lemnoscalidae were large carnivores or piscivores that hunted in the water and on land. And the primitive Tisegidae were medium-sized omnivores that are believed to be ancestral to both other families. True reptiles, also known as the first amniotes, first emerged in the Mississippi and diversified in the Pennsylvania. There are three main groups of reptiles, anapsids, diapsids, and synapsids. This classification was based on a number of holes in the reptile's skull or lack thereof. Now, however, anapsids are called parareptilia, and turtles are believed to be now diapsids with the rest of reptiles. However, this is impossible to be 100% sure of. Synapsids and diapsids, however, are still considered valid classifications. The very first uncrestable reptile, Hylomius, was quickly followed by the first diapsid, Petrolocosaurus, and the first synapsid, Archilo. Thysis. The amphibians' rule will not last, however. Every time period ends with an extinction event, whether minor or major. The Carboniferous was no different. The Carboniferous rainforest collapse saw the increased drying of the world. This caused the former cosmopolitan rainforests to fragment into many isolated pockets. This caused a massive harm to the animal life. The reduction of plants caused a rapid decrease in oxygen, which had allowed giant insects such as Meganerera and Arthropoda to exist. With the extinction of these larger species, the age of invertebrates truly ended, and were thereafter reduced to the roles they inhabit today. The amphibians were also affected a lot. The Temos Fracdali, in particular, were harmed by the sudden drying. However, reptiles fared better, with some of the first radiations of the class, such as the Cortoilosaurs and Omphicodonts. However, we will explore this further in the next episode of The History of Mississippi.